by Pastor Robert Dahmer of St. Mark's Lutheran Church. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The text for this morning is written in the Acts chapter 4, 12 verses. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now even tide. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers, the elders, and the scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked them, By what power or by what name have ye done this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of Israel, and elder people, and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this important man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand whole before you. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So far the text. Dearly beloved, we don't often think about the Holy Spirit, and yet he's very important in our lives. The third person of the Godhead is the force that brought you and me to faith and gives us the strength to confess what we believe. Think of what he did for the disciples. From fearful followers, they became outspoken defenders of the truth. Already on Pentecost afternoon, Peter, who denied our Lord, stood up and preached a powerful sermon of repentance and forgiveness on the basis of the resurrected Lord. And a few days later, he and John were given the opportunity to repeat that sermon to some unbelieving Jews in the city of Jerusalem. And here's how it happened. As they were on their way to the temple to pray, they saw a beggar that had been lame from his birth. And when that beggar caught sight of them, he asked for money. And Peter said, Silver and gold have we not, but such as I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he not only rose up, but he jumped and shouted for joy until people gathered around to find out what this was all about. And then Peter told them that it was by the power of Jesus of Nazareth that this man was made whole. This was the Jesus, he said, whom they crucified, but that God raised from the dead. And then he went on to tell them, quote, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. This powerful message offered hope to people who had killed the Lord. And the result was amazing. Many people that day came to faith. It was an exciting day. But the excitement didn't last. It wasn't long before the priests and the Sadducees and the ruler of the temple elbowed their way through the crowd until they found Jesus and then with 
power apprehended him and took them, him with them and cast them into prison until the next day. And all because he dared to speak about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus by his own power rose from the dead. And by the way, by the same power is going to raise you and me on the last day. It would seem that anyone, any thinking person who read this text would wonder how simply talking about Jesus rising from the dead caused such a violent reaction. If Peter had suggested the overthrow of government or if he had protested some civil wrong of his day like many contemporary churches do, well, you might have expected it. But to capture these people while they were still talking and throw them into jail is a harsh reminder of how much the world hates Christ. And isn't it interesting? This very message that they rejected, we read later on in the text that over 5,000 men in Jerusalem came to faith. And that tells us something. This enmity against Christ has been around ever since the fall into sin. When the Lord said to the devil, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. He meant that Christ, the seed of the woman, would forever be enmity against the world, the seed of the devil. The precious truths that we hold so dear anger the unbelieving world and lead them to react in ways as senseless as the ways of this text. You know, there are countries in the world where Christians are persecuted and even put to death. And that could happen here. The people in the know The philosophers and the scientists look down upon us as foolish dummies who hold to a divine creation or who hold to the sanctity of the institution of marriage. One man, one wife, cemented together for life or hold to the basic truth that Jesus Christ is the holy son of God who by his own power rose from the dead. The enmity of the world ought not surprise us. It certainly didn't the disciples because they knew what to look for. One time Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, because I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Or as he said in another place, referring to himself, If they do this to the green tree, what will happen to the dry? We see how this plays out in this text. Early the next morning, they took these two apostles and put them in their courtroom to be judged and convicted. And look who was there, we read in the text. Annas and Caiaphas and the high priest family, and the Sadducees. Now we recognize some of these names, don't we? We know Annas. He's the one that first heard Jesus and handed them over to the Jews. And we know treacherous Caiaphas. He's the one that handed our Lord over to Pontius Pilate to be put to death by crucifixion. And those people pretended that when Jesus arose, he didn't really rise. In fact, you know that. He paid the disciples so that they would say that, or paid the guards so that they would say that the disciples had chosen his body. You know, they hated the disciples because they told the truth. 
that Jesus is not dead, but that he's very much alive, and that he's at the right hand of God, as he told Pontius Pilate. And they were further upset by the fact that over 5,000 people turned to Jesus to believe him. They just couldn't allow this to go happen. But how were they going to stop the disciples? They came up with an idea that the disciples were just making it up. They demanded proof. They said, by what power or what name have you done this? To which Peter said, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, even by Jesus Christ is this man made whole. You know, it took remarkable courage for Peter to tell that assembly that they had murdered the Son of God. You could easily have expected Adams or one of them to rise up in anger and tear their robes like they did with Christ. But here it didn't happen because they were afraid of the people. And the last thing they wanted was to start a riot. Two important truths stand out in this text. One is the power of the Holy Spirit to change these disciples from fearful beings into defenders of the truth. And the other is the powerful message which they proclaim. You know, when Jesus was here on earth, he predicted this very scene, that the disciples would be hauled before magistrates and leaders of the people. Here's what he wrote. And when they bring you into the synagogues and magistrates and powers, take no thought how or what things ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. And powered by the Holy Spirit, this is how St. Peter ended our text. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Peter wasn't trying to anger his hearers, but he wanted them to know, those who murdered Christ, that that was not an unforgivable sin, but that Jesus Christ was alive and was at the right hand of God and offered forgiveness to those who repented of their sins. No matter how foolish their ideas about getting to heaven were, Peter says, there's only one way, quote, for there's none other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. This is such a simple truth, and yet the Jewish leaders rejected it And in our world today, the world has no love for God's people. It takes courage for you to stand up for what you believe. And the day may come, it may cost you your life. But you haven't lost anything, as the Savior says. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake will. Or as Dr. Luther sings, and take they our life, goods, fame, child, and wife, let these all be gone, they have nothing won, the kingdom ours remaineth. Your hope and mine is not in this world but in the promise of our resurrected Lord, 
I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The Savior asks you what he once asked Martha. Believest thou this? May we be moved to say with her, Yes, Lord, I believe. Amen.